Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this will be a deep dive into Apache Iceberg planning. Uh, by the end of this talk, you will understand the layout of Iceberg metadata and how the project implements local and distributed planning. I will also share some benchmarks that prove that Iceberg can quickly find files relevant for a query even if the underlying table contains tens of millions of files. Um, let's start with a few uh, key metadata concepts in Iceberg so that everybody can follow the rest of the talk. Iceberg metadata resembles a persistent tree data structure, which is fairly popular in functional programming. Um, the state of the table is prescribed by the catalog, which maps a table identifier into the currently valid root metadata file location. Uh, the catalog itself only stores the pointers. It doesn't really store any table state. At least it does, doesn't require uh, to store that state. Um, the only requirement for a system to act like an iceberg catalog is the ability to atomically swap table pointers, uh, which means that basic compare and swap functionality is going to be enough to act like an iceberg catalog. There is no need for like fancy lock mechanisms, um, even though you can implement atomic swap through a lock. This is what we do with HMS, for example. Uh, the root metadata file is uh, self-contained. It includes information about the schema of the table, partitioning specs, table properties, and a list of valid snapshots. A snapshot of a table is a read-only view of its data uh, at a particular point in time. The snapshot provides a complete listing of all the files that belong to the table when the snapshot was created. Uh, Files um, in a snapshot are being tracked by one or more manifest files, which we see at the bottom. Uh, manifest capture file location, partition tuple, column stats, sizes, and, and other information. All of the manifests for a snapshot are indexed in a manifest list, which is a separate ever file that is essential for quick navigation through large chunks of metadata, which we'll see later in the benchmarks. Uh, it's also important to understand how the metadata evolves uh, once we make changes to the table. Adding new files or changing table properties would result in the creation of a new metadata tree under a new root metadata file. So this slide shows an example um, of a table that's currently at version one and includes a single snapshot as zero um, it consists of two data files, file one and two at the bottom, which are being tracked by manifest A. And here's how the, the state of the table would look like after the append is done. So the append moves the table from version one to version two. And version two now includes two snapshots, S0 and S1. What's important here is that the manifest list for snapshot one references two manifests, uh, manifest A, that existed there before and covered file one and two, but also manifest B that was produced by this append for the newly added file in three and four. So the new snapshot consists of four data files, but Iceberg only produced metadata for file three and four and inherited all the previous state that existed before. Um, this type of structural sharing, I call it, um, is a key design principle that makes the commits lightweight because we can inherit everything that didn't change while still producing a new snapshot on every um, change to the table. Um, inheriting manifest is not always possible. So this slide includes an example of a copy and write merge operation where we try to update some of the records in file two, uh, which would mean that we would have to replace file two with something else. And this is how the metadata is going to look after the operation is done. So instead of inheriting manifest A, we actually had to rewrite it to mark file two as logically removed from the snapshot. In addition to creating manifest two, manifest B was, was the updates and inserts. Um, unlike copy and write, merge and read doesn't have the same requirement. 
because uh, it can actually inherit the manifest A as is. But instead, it would produce uh, two new manifests, one that would contain deletes uh, that apply to the previous state, and the one that contains updates and inserts in, in a separate data manifest. Um, this design is intentional, because merge and read is designed for use cases where you need to handle very sparse changes that are scattered across the entire data set. And if that's the case, then rewriting like lots of metadata on each commit would be a big problem. So this is how Merge and Read kind of avoids that issue. Cool. Let's talk a little bit about planning. Um, we'll first focus on use cases without delete files. We'll cover Merge and Read a little bit later. Let's assume there is a table that persists events, and each event is associated with the timestamp when it was generated and ID of the device that created it. In, in this example, the table is also partitioned by the days transform on top of the timestamp column. So this is what we call hidden partitioning in Iceberg. Um, instead of using columns for the actual transformation, you use um, partition transforms. We also configure all the writes to distribute data by partition and locally order by device ID. Essentially what this means that all of your data was in the partitions will be locally ordered by device ID. This configuration can produce the following snapshot. So we can have manifest A that will cover file one, two, and three. File one and two belong to the same partition, but they contain disjoint sets of records based on the device ID. So the file one contains uh, device IDs from 100 to 200, and then file two would contain um, everything um, up to that. Then we have manifest B that covers file four and five, and we cover uh, we have manifest C that covers file six. So overall, there are like six data files that are covered by three manifests. In reality, each manifest would cover up to like tens of thousands of data files. But this is just an example to show how the planning would work. All of the manifests are indexed in a manifest list. What's important here is that the manifest list would include the partition uh, min and max boundaries um, for all of the partition columns that uh, we have. So in this case, we have the TS day essentially is the output of the partition transform on top of the time step column. And let's assume we're looking for all of the changes that were generated by a particular device in a two hour time frame. Uh, the planning would start by reading the manifest list and filtering the entire manifest based on the already captured information. So in this example, we know that only manifest A may potentially contain data that's relevant for this query. So we will skip all the files that are covered by manifest B and C without actually even reading those manifests. Um, this step is simple, but it's extremely powerful, as we'll see in the benchmarks. And it's always done on the driver. So even if you have gigantic tables with tens of petabytes, it's highly unlikely that you would have more than 10 or like 20,000 manifests in a snapshot. It's going to be always possible to read this file on, uh, on the driver. Next, once we know the manifest that may potentially contain our mattress, um, we begin with the second uh, level of filtering, which is file filtering. We need to open these manifests and evaluate the query predicate against the partition tuple and the column bounds that were persisted. So at this point, Iceberg checks the number of driver cores, the number of slots in your cluster, the number of manifests that we have to open in their size to decide whether it would do it locally on the driver or it would try to parallelize it on the cluster. In this example, we only read in manifest A, so of course it's going to be planned on the driver. And once Iceberg starts processing these manifests, it will try to narrow down the scope of the operation even further by evaluating the, the predicate against the partition tuple and the bounds. So in this example, we know that file one and two uh, match the partition predicate, but we know that uh, only file one can contain uh, records for, for the device ID that we're looking for. So the, 
the result of this planning would be just the need to read file one. So to recap, the planning happens in two stages. So first of all, we read the manifest list and we filter manifests. And then uh, within the manifest, we try to find the files that may have matches for, for, for our query. Uh, let's see how it actually performs in practice. Um, I tested it in a table with 10 million partitions. And we had two data files per partition. So overall, we had 20 million data files in this table. Um, I had 15 columns. And we persisted lower and upper bounds for six of them. Uh, this required 850 manifests, was a little over um, uh, 7 GB of metadata. I tested multiple driver configs. Uh, the first one was, was only four cores, and the second one contained 12 cores. Um, both of them contain um, 36 GB of RAM. Uh, and for the larger driver, I also configured the number of threads. Uh, which is uh, to fetch the task results. This is something that's going to be useful for distributed planning later. In both cases, we used 15 executors, seven cores per instance, and 32 GB of RAM. Um, I tested three query types. The first one uh, included a partition and a sort key predicate, so it's a highly selective query. Uh, the second one included only a sort key predicate which means that Iceberg had to scan through all of the metadata, but the query was still selective. So the result of it, only like 20 files matched out of the 20 million. And finally, we tested the full scan. Uh, this is basically to show how, how long it's going to take if you need to fetch all of the data. Um, the first query we're going to look at included the partition in the sort key predicate. Um, there was no need to evaluate distributed planning in this case, because local planning completed in 0 0.25 seconds. Um, and this slide is actually pretty important, because it kind of proves that there is no need for a large cluster to work with just uh, gigantic tables if you are looking for a subset of the data. And all of this is possible because the manifests are indexed, so we can skip um, lots of metadata that's not relevant. This is the query that included only the sort key uh, predicate. So in this case, Iceberg had to scan through all of the metadata through every manifest. Um, in, in my view, local planning still performed fairly good. Uh, it only depending on the driver config. Uh, so the more cores you have, the faster it will go. The cluster two um, had 12 cores versus cluster one only had four cores. Um, and basically, it scales linearly. So three times cores, three times faster the planning, because each manifest is a, like a separate processing unit. So the more cores you have, the faster it will go. Um, this is the 12 core. We can probably throw 24 cores at it. It's going to be even faster than this. Um, distributed planning really excels in this use case, because we managed to parallelize all the manifest reading and filtering. And the result of that was just like a handful of files. So we had to collect back information about those. Um, and overall, it took only two and a half seconds. And it didn't really depend on the driver config. So no matter how small the driver, uh, the performance was the same. Here's the performance of a full table scan. So the local planning performance remained kind of the same, because we had to process the, all of the metadata anyway. Um, there is a bit of overhead because we had more splits, um, and we had to plan that. So there's like a few seconds overhead. But overall, it's pretty much the same. The distributed planning performance became worse. And it's because of how Spark, in this particular case, plans jobs. Um, Spark, unfortunately, doesn't really support truly distributed planning. So what happens, we can parallelize the manifest reading and filtering. But then you have to collect everything back to the driver at the moment. And uh, that actually means that you have to serialize all of the metadata and then send it back to the driver. And that, that's where the main bottleneck comes. So like 20 seconds um, out of, uh, of this bar probably was just spent on the serialization cost and sending back the results. Uh, we'll fix this in Spark in following releases. But for now, that's kind of the, the limitation that you're hitting. Um, yeah. 
And the reason why the, the distributed planning was faster in the, on the second cluster is because we had more driver cores. So driver was able to quicker fetch all of those pre-aggregated results from, from executors. Cool. Now let's see how the planning kind of changes uh, if we work with um, delete files and margin read. The snapshot metadata is going to look almost the same. So we'll still have manifest A that covers three data files. And then we have manifest B that covers file four. But now we'll also have a manifest C that covers all of the delete files. So in this case, we have delete one, two, and three that belong to different partitions. This is what we call partition scoped um, delete files in Iceberg. The manifests are still going to be indexed in the manifest list, and we will be able to navigate through that um, uh, uh, metadata in, this, in, in a similar fashion. Uh, we're going to look at the same query with the same predicate. And in this case, Iceberg would determine that manifest A potentially contains relevant data, and manifest C contains potentially relevant deletes. So we'll have to open both of them. Um, in this case. Similar to the what we've seen before, we'll do the file filtering in this case. Um, first, as we're going to open all of the delete um, metadata, and we would find all of the delete files that potentially have matches for our query. So in this case, we discarded delete two and three, but delete one potentially may have matches. So what's going to, uh, Iceberg next would basically build an in-memory delete file index and it would stream all of the data through that index assigning the deletes. So in Iceberg, deletes are assigned on demand whenever you query the table based on this in-memory delete file index. In the future, we'll um, allow to pre-assign them to save the cost, but uh, it's just a different set of trade-offs. You can say that which of the approaches is better. Evaluated the performance of, of this planning um, in the same table, but in addition to 20 million data files, we also added 10 million delete files, so actually a file per partition. The same number of columns, the same number of lower and upper bounds persisted, and in addition to 850 data manifests, we also um, needed um, 68 delete manifests, was a little over than 500 MB of metadata. So the amount of metadata you need for deletes is much smaller, because we capture less information. Um, the exact same cluster configs, nothing really changes, and the exact same query types. So this is the result for the partition and sort key predicates. Um, despite having like 10 million more files to manage, uh, the planning was only one tenth of a second slower. And that's because we can navigate through the manifests, uh, through, through the delete manifest in the same way we can navigate through data manifests. Um, so in this particular example, we only had to read an extra manifest and do the assignment of the delete. So that's where the tens of a second comes from. This is the sort key predicate only query. Uh, and I'm only showing the cluster two results. So this is the cluster that has more cores, like 12 cores. Um, if you compare it to before, there is like around 30 seconds overhead, and it's related to how uh, we're not able to skip deletes in this case. So we had to read all of the delete ma um, metadata, and we had to build the delete file index for it. So that's where, where the overhead um, happens, and this is the use case where, for example, pre-assignment of the deletes would, would help. Because um, if we pre-assigned it before, then we would have to spend this uh, right now. Distributed planning was substantially faster because while we were indexing deletes on the driver uh, in a separate thread, we still were doing like uh, data planning. So we were using the cluster resources to plan data while actually indexing deletes on the driver. Um, that's why it was m way more efficient in this case. And here's the full, uh, full table scan performance in this case. Um, the local planning, almost the same, just a little bit slower, and uh, like five seconds difference. And that's the cost of assigning deletes to 20 million data files. So it's just five seconds to assign 
um, all of those partition scope deletes to 20 million data files, which is pretty good. Um, the only thing that's missing here is that being able to filter uh, based on the sort key, which is not possible in this case because I was working with positional deletes. Um, and full table scan distributed planning still kind of um, showed a better performance. I want to wrap up with a few key takeaways. Uh, so first of all, local planning. It's going to be extremely fast if the query is aligned with the partition. Even if you have a tiny driver um, accessing gigantic table, it's still going to be really fast. And it allows you to cope with tens of petabytes of data as well. Um, it's not like you won't be able to plan the job, but your performance is going to depend on the parallelism of your driver. So the more cores you have, the faster you will go. Distributed planning would vary from query engine to query engine. Um, it really excels if you have selective queries that are not aligned with the partitioning. This is the use cases where you need to scan through lots of metadata. Um, and if your like, min-max indexes are helpful or if you have secondary indexing and you can narrow down the scope of that operation, um, that's the ideal use case for distributed planning. In the future, we'll extend, for example, Spark to be able to do truly distributed planning. So there would be no need to serialize the results back to just start the job. Uh, so after that, it would take a couple of seconds to even start uh, the full table scans on um, tables with tens of petabytes of data, which is pretty amazing. This is what, similar to what BigQuery does, because BigQuery, for example, doesn't have the same limitation. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, we'll open for some questions if there are any.